Welcome to FBC. Thanks for tuning in. We pray that you will allow God's Word to speak to you, to encourage you, and transform your life. Thanks for watching. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're talking about the most effective prayers of the Bible. And as you're turning there, I just want to show you a couple pictures. I've got guys all over the world sending me pictures of their prayer meetings from this last week. So we've got uh, India, Africa, Pakistan. We've got Virginia. Uh, we, we've got people from literally all over the world praying together. So, um, and they're praying these prayers along with us. So today we're only, we're only going to cover three of them, uh, but there are three that I think uh, could be life-changing for you. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet I, 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 Elijah, Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and I've done all these things at your command. Here's the prayer. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. Answer me, O Lord. So these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and called the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You may be seated. Well, maybe today you are in one of those situations that we get there just a few times in our lives, I think, when we need an absolute, big-time, huge, God-only miracle. We need God to break through. We need God to break something down. We need God to break in. We need God to do a God-sized miracle. Well, that's where, where Elijah was. But we're also going to talk today, if you're sitting here and you need to make some decisions, you need some direction, or maybe you're in a situation that you're, you're not, it's, it's uncomfortable to you, it's unfamiliar to you. You need daily wisdom. Maybe you're trying to raise kids and you need daily wisdom. Maybe your job is such that right now you need daily wisdom. Well, and then the last prayer we're going to talk about sets us up for the rest of the year, gets us started in the right direction, and that is making sure we have a clean heart, Amen. making sure we're really right with God. So we're going to talk about three, not, not all 21 prayers. As I told you last week, we began a journey, 21 of the most effective prayers of the Bible. I, I was, years ago, I was praying through the 630 prayers recorded in Scripture, and I found that there were 21 of them, prayed by individuals, short, simple, specific prayers, and God answered them, yes. And they were prayed by a variety of people about a variety of things. It's interesting. Uh, Monday, we prayed together over in the other auditorium, a lot of us, at 9 a.m. That was a great prayer meeting. And uh, the prayer of the day was, give me success. And I uh, had a man yesterday telling me, uh, he prayed that prayer on Monday, and he needed some clients, and he got some clients in his business that day. Yay, God. Uh, Tuesday, we prayed, bless me. I got a call from a friend of mine who's a pastor, and he said, we prayed, bless me. He was on our noon prayer meeting online, and uh, we were praying, bless me, to bless others. And he said, the treasurer called me up and said, Pastor, we just got a check for $315,000 to pay off our debt. God answered that prayer. Uh, I have people this morning that tell me they're going to email me because they got a lot of details they want to get in of how God's been answering. Realize you have not because you ask not. Amen. And so we're in a journey of seeing God answer prayers, and today we're giving you three of them. Answer me, give me wisdom, and I have sinned. So let's talk about this first prayer, answer me. 
Well, Elijah was in a situation where he needed a miracle. His nation was heading rapidly away from God. New king Ahab and his evil wife Jezebel were leading Israel away from God to worship idols. And they were, they were militant about it. They had a militant agenda to pull people away from God. And Elijah was the prophet of God. He's trying to stand up against this tidal wave flowing away from God. The people were flowing along in the wrong direction. And uh, God led him to, to this situation where he, was, he went to Ahab and he gave him a proposal. And so prior to that, I'm sorry, one of, the main God Ahab was pushing is the God Baal. Well, that's the God of thunder, lightning, and rain. Israel was an agricultural community. They needed rain. And to get their attention, Elijah prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three years. Now, you would think that would get their attention and they would repent, but it didn't. So God's giving them one more shot here. So he, he sends Elijah to go to Ahab and say, okay, we're going to have a duel. You get all your, all your false prophets, all your people worshiping Baal and, and uh, Asheroth and, and these false gods, and we will have a duel. We'll put down an altar and put an, a sacrifice on it, and whichever God can answer with fire, that's the true God. Now, that should be easy for Baal because he's the lightning God. So they got... The whole nation has all come out to this valley. They're all watching. There's this altar built. The prophets of Baal put a, a sacrifice on the altar. They began to pray and pray that, 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 that Baal would send fire from heaven, and nothing happens. And I like Elijah. He trash talks them. What's wrong? Your God is asleep. Uh, maybe he's in the restroom. Why, why is he not answering your prayers? He's trash-talking them, and they're praying, and they get so, uh, trying to get his attention, this false god's attention, they're even cutting themselves to get his attention. Nothing happens. So now it's Elijah's turn. He takes the, the, the sacrifice. First, he builds a trench around the altar, and then he soaks the, has the sacrifice get soaked in water uh, so much that it fills the trench up soaking wet sacrifice, and he goes um, before God, and he says in 1 Kings 18, 36, as we read, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. Now, what he had said prior to that is this. He'd said basically to the people, all right, quit sitting on the fence, Make up your mind. If God is God, go after him with all your heart. If Baal is God, go after him with all your heart. You can't play it either way. Either go for God or go for Baal. Amen. Well, he called out to God, and he says, I am your servant and have done these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you are Lord, O oh our God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And then in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell. Kaboom. Say, wow. Say it backwards. Think about that. It burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned up the stones, burned up the soil, and burned up all the water in the trench. Yay, God. When all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and cried, the Lord, okay, Yahweh, that's what, when it's capital like that, that's Yahweh, the Lord Yahweh, He is God. The Lord Yahweh, He is God. God came through in a big way. When you're doing God's thing, God's way, you can expect God to come through in big ways. My pastor friend, a $300,000 check for his church, that was transformational. Yay, God. 
Well, I want to tell you a story. When I was in college, I got to hear a missionary speak. Her name was Helen Rosevear. She was a missionary doctor to Central Africa, the Congo. And uh, one of the stories she told was about, she was a, uh, a doctor, right? So she's got a young mother who goes into uh, childbirth prematurely, dies during childbirth, delivers a premature baby, and already had a two-year-old. Well, you have to keep the premature baby warm. They didn't have any technology to do that. They didn't have an incubator. They had an old hot water bottle, but it was old, and when they put the hot water in it, it cracked. They did everything they could to keep the baby uh, alive and warm, but essentially, if the baby didn't get heat close to it in the right way within 24 hours, the premature baby would not live. Well, she had her nurses taking care of the baby, and then she says this. She, she went to, they had an orphanage, so she went, as she did every day, to go pray with the children at the orphanage. This, I'm going to read you what she wrote. I gave the youngsters various suggestions of things to pray about and told them about the tiny baby. I explained our problem about keeping the baby warm enough, mentioning the hot water bottle. The baby could so easily die if it got chilly. I also told them of the two-year-old sister crying because her mother had died. She continued, during the prayer time, one 10-year-old girl, Ruth, prayed with unusual, blunt conciseness and boldness, please, God, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead, so send it this afternoon. Now, they're in the Congo. Helen said, while I gasped inwardly at the audacity of that prayer, Ruth added, and while you're at it, would you please send a doll for the little girl so she will know that you really love her? Helen said, I couldn't say amen. I just didn't believe God would do this. Oh, yeah, I know he can do everything. The Bible says so, but, but there are limits, right? She says, the only way God could answer that particular prayer would be by sending me a package from the homeland. I've been in Africa four years and I had never, ever received a package from home. Anyway, if anyone did send me a package, who would put in a hot water bottle? I lived on the equator in Africa. Well, halfway through the afternoon, while she was teaching in nurses' training school, she says, a message was sent that there was a car at my front door, and by the time I reached home, the car had gone, but there on the veranda was a large 22-pound package. She said, I felt tears uh, running down my, uh, pricking my eyes. She said, I sent for the orphanage children, and together we pulled off the string, undid the knot. Excitement was mounting. From the top, I lifted out brightly colored sweaters for the children. Eyes sparkled as I gave them out. Then there were bandages for the leprosy patients, and the children were a little bored. Then I put my hand in again, and I felt... Oh my, could it be? I gasped and pulled it out. There was a brand new rubber hot water bottle. She said, I began to cry. I hadn't asked God to send it. I didn't even believe he could, but Ruth did. Well, she ran uh, in front of the children and pushed forward and cried out, if God sent the bottle, he must have sent the doll too. Rummaging down to the bottom of the box, she pulled out a small, beautifully dressed doll. Looking up at me, she asked, can I go over with you and give this doll to a little girl so she'll know that Jesus loves her? She wrote, that package had been on the way for five months. Packed by my former Sunday school class, whose leader had heard and obeyed God's prompting to send a hot water bottle even to the equator, and one of the girls had even put in a doll for an African child, five months before, in answer to the believing prayer of a 10-year-old to bring it that afternoon, she says, before they call, I will answer. She quotes Isaiah 65, 24. Amen. The point of that story is this. God is big. Amen. And God, there's no obstacle he can't overcome. You've got impossible situations. You've got obstacles that seem insurmountable. I understand. 
but we serve a big God. Amen. That little girl just believed, and God answered her prayer. I want to encourage you. Some of you these 21 days are praying for things that are bigger than, than you can imagine happening. But if your motives are right and your heart is right, God's, got, God's big enough to answer the prayers. Amen. Answer me, God. I need a miracle. Well, I want to give you a second one. This one's just a prayer I want to give you because I pray it every day, and you should too. It's the prayer, give me wisdom. Solomon was in over his head. He was the second son of the David-Bathsheba union. So he's born with a stain on his record. His home life wasn't easy. He had five stepmothers and wild half-brothers, including Amnon, who raped his half-sister, and Absalom, who murdered Amnon and tried to have a revolt against his father. Yet Solomon was to be given the reins of, the, of his father, David's kingdom. Now, can you imagine having to take over for David? David was the greatest superhero. I mean, he was a true-life superhero. As a teenager, he took down a giant named Goliath and brought victory to his nation. As a general, he never lost a fight. He survived being chased by a whole army through the wilderness. He wrote most of the Psalms. He became a king. He led the nation back to God. He was good-looking. He was intelligent. He was talented. He was a legend. He was a man's man, a lady's man. He was a man after God's own heart. He'd been a shepherd, a military hero, a songwriter, a, a folk legend, king. And now he laid out the plans to build a great temple to Yahweh God. And he said, Solomon, your job. Well, now David had just died, and Solomon had the, the weight of a nation on his shoulders. He had to step up and take David's place as the king. You know, he was facing more than he could handle. Some of you are in situations right now where you don't have all the answers. You don't know everything you need to know. You're trying to figure stuff out. Maybe you're in the midst of a decision, and you just can't see exactly what you're supposed to do. You need wisdom. You need wisdom. Well, God shows up and speaks to Solomon and says, ask me for whatever you want. Now, you would think he would ask for money, fame, power, Maybe superpowers. I think it'd be cool to fly. Second Chronicles 1.7, this is Solomon's response. He says, you have shown great kindness to David, my father, and made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, let your promise to my father David be confirmed, for you made me king over the people who are as numerous as the dust of the earth. Here's his prayer. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people. And for who is able to govern this great people of yours? Give me wisdom and knowledge so I can govern these people. Solomon knew what to ask for. He knew what to ask for. Solomon spent his growing up years studying with the wisest men in the kingdom, accumulating the wisdom of the ages, collecting parables in a book we read as Proverbs, in that book, he makes a couple statements about a wisdom. Proverbs 3 says, blessed is the man who finds wisdom. It's more profitable than silver, better returns than gold, more precious than rubies. Long life is in her right hand, her left hand are riches and honor. He says, you're blessed if you find wisdom. Chapter 4, verse 3 says, get wisdom, get understanding. Don't forget my words or swerve away from them. Do not forsake wisdom. Chapter 4, verse 7, he says, wisdom is supreme 
Therefore, get wisdom. So he prayed for wisdom. A definition of wisdom, biblical wisdom, is this, seeing and responding to life from God's point of view. Wisdom isn't just having a bunch of knowledge and winning on jeopardy. Wisdom is being able to look at life situations, problems, decisions, seeing it from God's point of view and responding to it accordingly. Where do you need wisdom? I can tell you, this is a prayer I pray every day. God, give me wisdom. There's decisions to make. There's, there's situations to deal with. Sometimes you're dealing with a difficult person. You're dealing with a difficult situation. Give me wisdom. Solomon prayed for wisdom. Well, God said to Solomon, I'm reading 2 Chronicles 1. 2 Chronicles 1. So let's go there. God said to Solomon, since this is your heart's desire and you've not asked for wealth, riches, or honor, nor the death of your enemies, and since you've not asked for a long life, but for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people over whom I've made you king, therefore wisdom and knowledge will be given to you. I'm going to give you wisdom, but because you asked for the right thing and not the wrong thing, I'm going to also give you wealth and riches and honor, such as no king has ever had before you. And none after you. In 1 Kings, this is just how much wisdom God gave him. 1 Kings 4, it says, God gave Solomon wisdom and great insight and breadth of understanding. As measureless as the sand of the seashore, Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man. So God gave him great wisdom. And like almost every one of these prayers, they're repeated elsewhere in the Bible. For example, James, the most practical of the books of the New Testament, says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously. God wants to give you wisdom. So maybe you're trying to make a difficult decision. Maybe you're trying to think your way, work your way through a challenging time. Ask for wisdom. If you need God to do a big, huge, amazing thing, go to God and say, God, answer me. If you need God to give you wisdom for the situation you're in, give me wisdom. Let me give you one more. I have sinned. You remember David, right? You remember what he did? I mean, it was ugly. David's life, you can, you can read about it. It's kind of an upward trek to this point. Things are going well. He's being successful as a king. He gets into his midlife crisis. He doesn't buy a sports car. He doesn't start wearing a gold chain around his neck. Uh, he opts out of his responsibility of leading his nation to battle. While he stays home, he initiates an illicit affair with a married woman named Bathsheba. She gets pregnant, and to hide the pregnancy, he has her husband sent home from the battle. But her husband has more character than David. He said, I'm not going to sleep with my wife if my comrades are out there suffering and they're not getting to sleep with their wives. So David uh, thinks he has no other options, so he basically structures it so Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, is on the front line and will be killed. Terrible sin. And if you read Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, you realize guilt ate him alive. He felt it physically, emotionally, spiritually. You see, heaven is, in essence, the fullness of the presence of God. Hell is the complete absence of the presence of God. When you sin, it blocks you from the presence of God. And David, in his guilt, went through a living hell for a year. 
But you know God is good, and God is merciful, and if you belong to God, God doesn't just let you wander away. God pursues you. And God pursued David through a prophet named Nathan who told a story about a, a murderous thief and said, David, what, what should be done to this thief? And David said he should be executed. And then Nathan said, you're the man. You're the man. And David knew exactly what he meant. You know, we live in a culture that takes sin so lightly. I used to live in a city that celebrated sin. Sin city. God has not changed. God is high and God is holy and God hates sin. God hates sin and he hates what it does and he hates that it separates us from him. Though God in his great mercy sent his son to leave heaven, live a sinless perfect life, take our sin, our condemnation, and die for us a horrible, brutal death with untold physical, emotional, and spiritual agony to pay for our sin so we can be forgiven. We take it so lightly. I wonder if I was to print out your thoughts or actions or words or deeds from the last six weeks. I wonder what we would see. David said, I have sinned. I have sinned. He acknowledges his sin. He agrees that it is sin. He agrees that it's wrong. The word confess doesn't mean I'm sorry. It means I agree with God. I agree with God that this is sin. It is wrong. It means agreement. Confess means to agree. And David agreed with Nathan, and he said, okay, I have sinned. And out of his mercy, Nathan speaks incredible words to David, and he says, the Lord has taken away your sin. Now, all the consequences didn't disappear, but the Lord has taken away your sin. Some of us, most of us, Stand before God guilty. I want to read to you some words that are only possible because of Jesus. Isaiah 43, I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake and remembers your sins no more. Micah chapter 7, who is a God like you who pardons our sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Psalm 103, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I had a friend in high school trying to win her to Christ, and she said she couldn't because she had intellectual obstacles. But she also had another obstacle. She had been immoral, and she was very guilty about that. Well, the testimony of other kids in our high school who were getting saved, and the love of God that was pursuing her, one night she finally bowed her knees and asked God to forgive her. 
and put her faith in Jesus Christ and was saved. Amen. I was talking to her the next day, and she like, it's like somebody plugged her in. She had a light in her face that wasn't there before. And she said, I've never felt so clean in my life. She said, I, I feel like a little girl in a brand new white dress dancing with Jesus in a spring rain. She said, I had no idea it was so good to be forgiven. I'm going to walk you through a list I go through. And uh, I want you to be honest. Look, if you're not going to be honest, what's the point? And when God points something out to you, don't excuse it or rationalize it or minimize it. Agree. Agree. Think about things you've done. Maybe things you thought, said, spoke that displeased God. Unrighteous anger, spiritual apathy, arrogance, bitterness, complaining, critical spirit, a consumer mindset, cheating, doubt, despair, envy, Fear, gluttony, greed, gossip, grudges, idolatry, impatience, jealousy, judgmentalism, lust, Lying, lack of love for God, lack of love for others, materialism, negative attitude, practical atheism, believing the right truths but not living by faith, pride, rebellion, Refusal to forgive, refusal to reconcile, selfishness, self-centeredness, self-righteousness, slander, worry, Is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now, you're the man, you're the woman. Sin is also not just crossing the line and doing bad, it's failing to do good. James says, if you know the right thing to do and don't do it, it is sin. Amen. Think about things you should have done or should be doing. Reading your Bible, having a daily prayer time, leading your family in prayer, generous giving to the Lord, Faithfulness and weekly worship, honoring your parents, serving the Lord, sharing the Lord with other people, serving your mate, loving people unconditionally, taking steps to forgive or to reconcile with somebody else. I 
As we approach the Lord's table, is there somebody you need to forgive right now? Two thousand years ago, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. Essentially, he's saying, in just a little bit, I'm going to be crucified for you. And he took bread and he took a cup. And he said, this is for the forgiveness of your sins. You know, the, one reason we don't see answer to prayer is we don't pray. And the second major reason is we got sin in our life. The prayer God's wanting to hear out of our mouth isn't do this or do that, give me this, give me that. The prayer God wants to hear out of your mouth is, forgive me. I agree. Why on earth start your year with something between you and God? Amen. Why not start your year as close to God as you can be? As clean before God as you can be. Let's bow our heads for a minute. In the next minute or two, ask the Holy Spirit, show me, what do I need to confess? And when he points something out, don't argue it, just say yes. I have sinned. What have you done that needs to be forgiven? What have you not been doing that you know you should be doing? Who do you need to forgive? Father, we have sinned. We live in a nation of sinful people. God, we could go on and on confessing the sins of our nation. But judgment begins here in the house of God. Holy Spirit, judge us. Heavenly Father, forgive us. Restore us. We are sorry. We are sorry, Lord. Wash us that we might be whiter than snow. The night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And I invite you, if you'd like, to take bread with me. And he said, this bread is going to be to you, my body, broken in behalf of you. 
as often as you eat it, remember me. He also took a cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant of forgiveness written in my blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. He took our place, experienced hell for us, died and rose again to tear the wall down. He said, this cup is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, do so remembering me. Thanks for watching today's message. If you have any questions or comments, or if you made a decision for Christ, please reach out to us at info at firstgc.org. That's info at firstgc.org. Thanks again for watching.